Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here today and uh, being with us um, uh, online. Um, I'm Helle Grenli, and I serve as an associate research scientist at Yale, um, managing a project on the feasibility of renewable thermal technologies in Connecticut uh, through the Center for Business and the Environment. Uh, in a moment, I will uh, introduce our speaker, Avin Leista. Um, but I want to start out with a few announcements. Uh, this talk is being sponsored by the Blueprint for Clean uh, Energy webinar series and the Clean Energy Finance Forum. Uh, Blueprint is a platform for leading clean energy practitioners and researchers to share the latest opportunities in corporate, nonprofit, and public private arenas. And the Clean Energy Finance Forum advances the growth of energy efficiency and solar energy finance markets in the United States by providing high quality industry news, building professional dialogue and fostering innovation. So for more information about these uh, programs, you can go to uh, CBA's webpage, cbay.yale.edu. Uh, this talk is being broadcast live so uh, if you have a question or comment, please uh, push the button and uh, keep pushing it when you're asking your question or uh, posting your comment. And for you online listeners, uh, please submit questions uh, to our speaker via the YouTube comment box throughout the session and then we will organize the Q&As uh, along the way. So now I would like to introduce uh, Eivind Leista, our speaker. Uh, Eivind, he is a program director at uh, ANOVA. And in this role, he is responsible for uh, a big share of the uh, financial um, uh, programs in energy efficiency and renewable um, energy in Norway. And this is ranging from small residential customers to large industrial customers. It's covering transportation, it's covering uh, new technologies and uh, infrastructural um, investments such as uh, district heating. Prior to ANOVA, Eivind uh, used to work as a senior advisor for the Norwegian Ministry for uh, Oil and or Petroleum and Energy. And in this role, he was also responsible for designing the business model for ANOVA. So after having observed how ANOVA was working for a couple of years, he decided to actually start working there when he figured it actually did work. Uh, so he helped establishing ANOVA, and uh, now he has been working there for more than 10 years. Eivin, thank you so much for joining us to share your insights. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you every one of you for, for showing up and also to those of you following us on, on the net. Um, as Helle said in her introduction, I will give you some perspectives from, from ANOVA. And before I go into ANOVA's mission and what we actually do as an organization and how we run our measures, I will just give a little brief background about the policy scene in Norway and also what's the current goal for the energy policy. Um, as you might be aware of, Norway is a, what you could call a energy-driven economy. Energy is a fairly large share of, of the economy, both because we have, we have been blessed with a lot of resources, natural resources. We have a fairly high production of renewable electricity, mostly hydro, and I think uh, 30,000 megawatt. That's about um, one third of uh, the installed capacity here in the US. But uh, when you are 200, 300 million inhabitants, we are 5 million. So, so this is a, a large, yeah, it's, it's a large business in, in Norway. Um, besides having a fair share of renewable electricity in our supply, we also have some bioenergy, both in residential heating, but also in more traditional wood processing industries. And we have over the last years been building up uh, a district heating system in all major cities and towns in Norway. As you can see from the figure, we use about 240 terawatt hours in our inland consumption. Uh, about one third of that is in industry, one third is in industrial, uh, in uh, the service sector and in the um, residential sector. 
and the last third is in transport, agriculture, mining, fisheries, and, and, and other businesses. Um, what's important to be aware of when you are dealing with your energy policies, that's the energy intensity of the industry or the economy as such, but also the industries. And um, we have experienced that we have more or less, we make or we use half the energy today to create the same values as we did in the 1970s. And actually we have had a 40% uh, drop in the energy intensity from 1990 and up till today. This has, of course, to do about energy efficiency taking place in, in all sectors and both in the residential and, and in all kinds of businesses. But it also has to do quite a bit about changes in the economy as such and the industrial sector. And that brings me to the next bullet point, which is very important for Norway, is that we have a quite substantial oil and gas production where we have our resources out in the North Sea and, and doing a lot of offshore oil and gas um, exploration. And as you can see of the figures, we produce approximately 10 times as much oil and gas compared to our inland consumption. And this is, well, one thing is it's a lot of energy, but another thing is this creates a lot of income for the Norwegian economy as such, and it has been a very important driving force for our economy over the, the last decades. Another thing that's, so, so that's, that's an industry in itself, and of course, Norway has its own oil and gas policies, but when it comes to the energy policy and how we supply our industries and our economy with the energy we need, it's also important to be aware of that the oil and gas industry producing energy, mostly for export, of course, it's also a very energy efficient industry in itself. In order to produce those 2,300 terawatts that we export every day, we don't use that much energy. And they are more or less self-sufficient through their gas fire power plants out on the, on, the, on the platforms out in the North Sea. So it doesn't put a lot of constraint on the inland energy system. Just about 10% of the energy they need out of the 50 terawatt hours they need is drawn from the inland electricity system. So I will come back to that, what that means when it comes to energy intensity and what could be a challenge for Norway in the future when the oil and gas production is going down. But then, of course, there is another side to this as well, which is a, a policy era in itself, and that's, of course, the climate uh, policies and the climate issues we are dealing with. Oil and gas uh, extraction and treatment and, and, what, and also with other industries create quite a bit of, of um, climate gas emissions. I don't know how we are on a world average, but I guess we are kind of there on, on the average maybe. And, and the larger or emission sectors in Norway is oil and gas with approximately 25%. But besides that, where we are different from other nations, we have hardly any emissions from the electricity sector. So the next biggest sector when it comes to emissions is the transport sector. And then after transport sector, we have traditional industries like aluminum plants, ferro plants, and, and other businesses. So, so that makes Norway a little bit different than, than other countries, both when it comes to the energy structure and also when it comes to emissions. So, so that's some, some key figures and some backgrounds. When we look at the current policy goals, I don't think this is very different from other industrialized countries, which has uh, both uh, environmental policy and some concern in, in that regard, but also concerns about their economic growth. This triangle, I think you find in, at least in the EU, but probably here in the US as well. There is a concern about security of supply. Energy is vital for all parts of the economy and kind of to drive society. Uh, uh, energy is an uh, important input into economic growth. Most businesses and value creation in some sense needs energy. But then, of course, there is also an environmental concern that most energy production and end use also causes pollution or, in, or, or some negative effects on, on the environment. And uh, in Norway, as in many other countries, our, our generation's big concern is the climate gas emissions. And uh, it's, and 
Because of that, we have quite high goals in Norway when it comes to cutting emissions. And this is also then, even though being a policy area in itself, also becomes a very important part of the energy policy. And Norway has uh, tied up to the EU targets more or less, and we have this ambition about cutting our emissions by 20% within 1920, no, 2020. Um, that I think is possible to happen as long as we use the flexible mechanism and the quota systems that we have within the European economic area that you can kind of like buy our way out of it by buying CO2 or cutting emissions in other industries and countries. And now we are also negotiating with the, uh, the European Union in order to tie up with a 23rd target, which means a 40% cut in the emissions. And then it starts to get tough because that also means that you have to cut in other industries than those covered by the quota system that we have in the European economic area. But not enough with that. The long-term goal in Norway, as in many other countries, I think, is to try to make a shift over to the low carbon economy. A truly shift where you can see that you can you know, create the value needed to, to nurture your society and actually also produce the goods you need in order to maintain the welfare system and, and you know, make people happy, to, to say it that way. Uh, without hardly having any emissions at all. When that's gonna happen and what it's gonna look like is a little hard to say, but there is no doubt that that's the ambition in the long run. And that's uh, where we come in from, from ANOVA as well, that we have a, being a, kind of like having a mission, kind of like driving that development. Um, uh, what we're gonna do is, you know, nurture that development that has to take place in order for this to happen. But, even though this is being maybe most, the most important driving force for our mission, there is still a concern about security of supply that needs to be handled every day. And this goes together in that triangle that I showed you previously. Today, uh, security, well, what's, what's a concern about security of, of supply in a country that has large resources and much larger, larger resources than we use ourselves. Well, then Norway is a little odd country, especially in, in Europe, I guess. We have all this hydro, which is a blessing, but we also have cold climate. So in years where we have a drought and a special cold winter, we might have a problem because we might have a deficit of hydropower. And, and we kind of have some constraints on the electricity systems that makes it hard to supply all the electricity needed at, at one time. So, so, so that's a little special in Norway. It's more kind of like a luxury problem maybe that can, it's, it's solved in many ways, but there is a, a reason why we should diversify over supply a little bit more and don't be so uh, reluctant of the, of the hydropower. So, so that's something we have been dealing with till now and it, it's still a concern that we have, but that's more like of a short term. If you look a little bit more in the long term, I believe that Norway will have pretty much the same concern about security of supply like a lot of other countries, which is now increasing the share of renewables. We will see changes in production from more centralized to more local production, and we will definitely see a change in the end use. Since electricity is a good way of getting rid of emissions in the, in, in the end use. Um, and, and that's, uh, yeah, and then, then we had, for example, that's gonna happen if we're gonna put a lot of electricity into the transport sector, that they might have a total different need for security of supply than we see in stationary energy use. But it, this is a future which is kind of like hard to picture, but, but, but anyway, I think in the long run, uh, the, the, the access to renewable energy sources might also be a concern for Norway. So, 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 so maybe we will look more like other countries in, in, in the long run. Uh, if you look at economic growth, which is also a very important for the energy policy and, and what the energy policy should support, uh, Norway have a challenge in the future when the oil and gas production will go down because you, all that energy that's a lot of money for, for the Norwegian economy. And in a, in a top year like 2011 with high oil prices and high production, 
the, the total value creation from the oil and gas activity was about 700 million Norwegian kroner, which is about 100 billion um, US dollar, approximately, a little, bit, a little bit less. But if that was to, if that value creation was to be produced from the traditional industry or the service sector, we would have to use a whole lot more energy. And what that figure shows, if that, those 7,000 billion was replaced by traditional industry, we had to use 200 terawatt hours more, or if it was replaced with revenue creation or value creation in the service sector, we would have to use approximately 100 terawatt hours more. So this is not you know, gonna happen because we, we are not gonna lose that oil and gas production overnight. It's gonna take decades, but what it actually shows is that it's important to maintain a focus on energy efficiency and lower that energy intensity in the economy in, all, in order to replace this value creation. But it also gives an idea that renewable energy and renewable energy production, we probably have to increase that in the future if we're gonna maintain the welfare systems we have today and the tax income that's needed for, for the state. So, so, and I think this is on the agenda just today, very important in, in Norway, mainly due to low oil prices, of course, they are, but maybe the low oil prices is more the normal than the oil prices we have experienced over, over the last 10 years, for example, where, where it has been a steadily growth and, and Norway have made a lot of money. So, this, I think, sums up the, the three major goals for the energy policy, is the security of supply, it's, it's something that we are handling today, but that, perspective, that issue might change in the future. Economic growth and how the LNG policies will support economic growth is becoming more and more important as we see the income from the oil and gas industry is going down. And of course, we have this over generation big challenge when it comes to um, pollution and uh, climate gas emissions that also need you know, to be tackled through our ambitious energy policy. And that's, I guess, that's where Enova is, is coming in. Because our mission then, or first a little few figures about Enova, we, we were set up, um, maybe Helle said that, that, we were set up in 2001. We are owned by the ministry. Um, we manage a fund, which is our task, you know, to use money in order to make things happen. Uh, our budget is approximately 300 million US dollars a year. We are 80 people, so we have to rely on others to make this happen. And since we started, we have granted about 2 billion US dollars, and we have a finance project with an energy result, either energy saving or new production of approximately 20 terawatt hours altogether. So yeah, but then our mission then, uh, our role is to bring about a long-term change in energy production and energy use in a more environmental friendly way and to introduce new uh, energy technologies into the market. And the way we should do this is by triggering a sustainable and long-term market change. And the last thing is very important because you can, you can always have change as long as you pay for it, and you can just pay more and more to make more and more happen. But for markets to be truly sustainable, they must also be sustained really in an economical way at some point in time. Basically mean that new solution had, have to be competitive at a certain time. So, so, so that's very important. So when you go into the market and you look for the possibilities and you look at different barriers and what should we work with, you have to have an idea that this, we're gonna solve this in a way and that we see a future where actually this solution that we are working with are competitive and actually outcompete the more polluting ones. So, so, so that's a very important thing because if you don't have that focus, you only have change as long as you pay for it. And that's not, I don't think that's effective or efficient for, for it's not effective in the long run and it's definitely not efficient for the state. So. What have we done in, all, you know, in order to set up a business or set up a initiative that, so that's a, uh, possible to work with? Because here we are talking about things to happen in a very long-term perspective. 
as long as every day, to, uh, along with every day, day business going on. So you have to make money every day as well as you aim at a, another future in a way. So then you need some guiding principles and that's, that's have been very important for us that we have been able to set up this organization. It's political driven, it's solving a political goal to say it that way. And, and then we have seen you know, what's, what's important to have that happen. And we have, it's no doubt of having a clear mission like the mission I so, showed you before and the way we work, how important that is and to have an agreement on that, which is kind of like across the different political directions in Norway. So we are able to maintain this long-term focus, it's very important. And then we also have the politician kind of put some constraints on themselves by managing this on an arm length distance. Basically means that politicians don't enter into single you know, decision about single project and where we decide to put our money. That's, that's an important part of it because that, that reduces political risk in what we are doing and we can more focus on the technical risk and, and the market risk. And then, um, yeah, it goes along with Enova's freedom then to choose over measures and which project to, to, to support. And don't, we don't have any political influence in that and, and we can you know, try to do a, as best job as possible. And then long-term financing is important. So we don't have to you know, empty the budget every year. We can carry on budget for the next years and we can also save up in order to you know, go into market with where we will need more, more resources than the yearly budget. Uh, and then to have the possibility to enter into all sectors and kind of like, kind of like look at all the opportunities, not being told to go here and there. That, that's also important to have a open mind and being technology neutral to start out with. That's, that's been a very important precondition. And then at least, and where I think we have been different than other initiatives here, to have quantitative targets to be measured every day, what do you actually deliver? So it's not just ideas and good thoughts, but it's actually pro projects either saving money or producing new renewable energy. So that's very important guiding principles. But then in order to be kind of, you know, we need to structure, we can't kind of run around there and looking for all kinds of possibilities and attracting or attacking any barrier. So it's structure over business along two major strategies. Where one is to work with technology development and lowering technology costs, kind of like entering into the, to the innovation chain and, and you know, push the technology closer to the market together with technology developers and early adopters of the technology. The other strategy is to you know, kickstart markets, to get markets going for new solution, make uh, best available technologies, you know, help them enter the market and help them grow their market so at some time in the future they can actually develop on their own and they don't need any support anymore. Along these strategies, either if you choose the technology strategy or the market development strategy, there is an increase in capital expenditure. If you're doing technology development, when you're gonna enter the market, you need to build a demonstration project, you have to invest more in, in your product and in your processes, and you have to, you know, you you have to do that upfront before you have any income or, or revenues. And the same with the market. If you're going to enter the market with a new product, you have to you have to kickstart the market in a way. You might have to sell it with a rebate to say it that way, and that's actually a capital expenditure. So what we do then is that we go in and we lower that capital um, expenditure by giving subsidies and we also take down the risk in specifically that part of either the market transformation or the building of markets, or when you do your technology development and you know, in that phase where you are closing the market. So that's, that's how we try to structure what, um, what we do. Uh, there are um, different things that we can go into, and I, I, don't, I don't want to go into to, to all of that, but we, have, we are working with households, uh, resi or residential sector, service sector, a lot in buildings, building district heating, 
now building an infrastructure for electric vehicles, you know, the, the charging points. Uh, we, have, we are building an infrastructure for supporting electricity to uh, ships that's in the harbor, so they don't have to run their generators and keep the engine going. Um, we are doing things in heavy industries, small industries. We are basically in all sectors. Not so much in agriculture, but that's, that's and, and not so much in, in fisheries, but we are entering into that as well. So, so I will just now give you some, some examples because there are so many to choose from. I think we have supported more than seven, 8,000 projects over the years. So, so, so there's a lot to choose from. But one larger project that we have done recently and has a lot to do about replacing that economic act or creating that new economic activity that we need for the future. That's you know, nurturing an energy efficient and climate friendly industry. An industry which has the potential to survive in a future when we are all greener. So, uh, and, and, and actually in heavy industries in Norway, like heavy industries in all other countries was bad polluters at some time back in the days. But they have actually been able to change their behavior and, and change the focus over time. And, and this is an example how we enter into, to, uh, together with Norsk Hydro, which is a large aluminum producer in Norway and actually also uh, globally. And we actually financed a more or less full-scale pilot for next generation aluminum production, which has been, even though it's just 15% more efficient than world average, they're closing where it's actually possible to operate with that kind of process. If you're gonna do something else, you totally have to change into another process. So, so this has been a big investment and the appetite for this kind of industrial investment is very low in the whole Western hemisphere, to say it that way at the time. So, so they actually made the decision to do this project and actually to, to start investing it uh, this week. Or was it last week? Anyhow, it was just recently and it shows that going in there and actually just lower that, that uh, capital expenditure and take down that risk, it works. And then it's gonna be very interesting to see if they're gonna expand that pilot into a full scale aluminum factory, which is, then you have to time seed with three at least, I guess, to, to have, a, to have a, a full scale in investment. So, so that's, a, that's, very, um, that's very interesting. Uh, we have done similar project like that. We have also an American company, Alcoa, which operates in Norway with some other aluminum plants, and we are working with them as well on their technology track, which, which might be a little different than, than Hydra's. So, so it's, um, if you can get that race going within those industries, that could really help, you know, and to create an industry which has this potential of surviving also in the future. Um, another example when it comes to, you know, following that technology strategy, but it, which is totally different, is working with a new building standard, new building code. Uh, we adopted this word, passive houses from Germany. I'm not sure why we did that, but anyhow, it's, I guess it represents that it's houses that hardly need any extra energy to, you know, to solve their heat demand at all. They are more or less self-sufficient with heat, basically because they are very well insulated and the activity taking place in the heat house actually give you the heat you need. So, so here we are talking about a demonstration scheme which was set up, lasted for three years, and was able to change the building code, Norwegian building codes by demonstrating and reaching a 10% uh, market share. We were actually able to transform, or I should say, at least transform the most ambitious contractors and actors within, within the housing sector. So, and uh, from this year, this uh, some kind of a, a very, uh, this level of energy efficiency of building is gonna be a mandatory standard. But that's, that's totally different than working with Norsk Hydro, which is a big one of a kind industrial player. Here we are affecting thousands of carpenters and a lot of small companies and so on. And you actually, to get everyone on board there, you need to follow up through the building codes. You can't rely on just people being in, 
innovative on their own. So, so and, and that's also in, uh, one thing that's important. You need to end this program at some certain time. When you start to subsidize something, you need to have a clear ID on when you're gonna stop, either because it's not gonna work, or you have reached a level where this should go by itself. And that's, that's a very important thing when you go in there, even if it's working with big business or it's working with, within the residential sector, you can't create a system where the market gets totally dependent on the subsidy. Then it's never gonna be sustainable in the long run. So that was, uh, was one example. If you are looking more at the uh, market development path that I talked about, that's, that's what we have done with district heating, for example. You take down the cost and the risk by doing um, infrastructure investments, which has a very, very long lifetime. When that is built, you give the industry all incentives actually to create a business and become profitable as fast as possible, basically meaning to grow the volume as fast as possible. So that's more an example where you go into something which is not very technical innovative or, or uh, kind of like very hard to do. It just costs, it's costly to get started because you have to dig a whole lot of uh, infrastructure, basically money into the ground. And there is uncertainty and you have to hope for these customers to come. But by doing so, we have been able then to, you know, build this second infrastructure. Has a lot to do about the possibility to use bioenergy, waste heat, and other cheap energy sources with a lot of, well, it doesn't create a lot of additional pollution. But this has also to do about security of supply and building a second infrastructure. And, you know, diversify over, over energy supply. Uh, yeah. And, and when it's not possible with uh, district heating, we have been, you know, working with replacing oil boilers and, and also after some time having instruments here for, for the single household. Uh, quite substantial investment over time. Uh, and it's, it's been uh, one of the larger activities we have had, but also even though we are, we are still running this program, now it's basically an, at its end of its lifetime because we have been able to establish the basic infrastructure in all major cities and towns. And now this has the potential to develop on its own. And also when it comes to the biofuel market, now there is enough demand, so that's becoming more and more a mature business and, and it's going more and more on, less on, on its own. Um, Another example then about building markets, and which is a totally different market when, than both district heating and large industry, is all the households. It's approximately two and a half million households in Norway. Um, very difficult to get to in a way. There are so many of them. Uh, very few have very strong incentives to do anything at all. They are concerned about their everyday life and a lot of other stuff going on. So why bother about energy supply as long as we can buy cheap electricity, which is also renewable? So that has, that's a totally different ball game and you have to think mass distribution, building markets within most a lot of players, both on the supply side and not at least at the demand side. And that, that's a totally different, different story. But the idea there is to establish this market for the best available technologies and you know, promote them in a way so uh, households actually want to buy them. And we don't ask so much why they want to buy them. For some, it's, they could save money, but for someone it's about being green. For other one, it's to increase the value of your house because you think that in the future I might sell it and it's worth more if I have a good energy system. So. And the way this is done is basically just by giving a 25% cash refund. It's like financing a rebate going on sale. And then you have here, you have to be very strict on what technologies you, you support and which you don't support and for how long and how good should they be in order to get the market going and make it grow on its own. So, so here, the, the scheme, has to last for a while. But it shouldn't, you know, be open for any technologies for infinity. You have to end it at some time and you have to give them some 
some clear thoughts on when we suspect the technologies to be, you know, to be able to manage on their own. So, so, so that's uh, that's some uh, some example. Um, another example that we invested quite a bit in in the early days, so, or what I should say, early days. It took a while till we get, got started, but that was wind power. Norway has very good wind resources because we have a very long coast. We're fairly far north up in the Atlantic, blows a lot. So we have very good resources. Uh, but on the other hand, we have all that cheap hydro, so it's not that easy to make a wind power plant profitable. So, uh, but uh, what we saw the potential of getting a Norwegian wind industry kickstarted, actually to then to finance the first two terawatt hours of, of production, which is, I guess, around 700 megawatt installed. No, yeah, 700 megawatt installed. That that's not a lot, but it's a few fuel full scale wind power plants. Um, you have now a green certificate uh, scheme together with Sweden. Which is going to, you know, that's a market-driven system that's going to make sure that we increase the production of renewable in those two countries with, to uh, no, 28 terawatt hours over the till 19 no, 2020. So, so, uh, but the whole idea was then to kickstart this and see if we could actually grow a, yeah, competitive wind industry in Norway. I don't know how that's going to go, but. Uh, this week we had a major decision about building, I think it's a 1.5 billion US dollar investment in the area where, where my office is, which, which is gonna be financed then through the green certificate uh, system. I think that it's different wind parks, but they are in a network together, and it's one decision. I think that's gonna produce approximately 3.4 terawatt hours of wind, which is quite substantial when the total Hydro production in Norway is 130 or so. so. So, so that's another example. That's something that ended, but but of course was also then um, it and it entered wind entered into a new system, this green certificate system. So, so there's still subsidies there, but it's gone gone from this system where we had more or less a tendering process through ANOVA, where this now has to be solely decided based on market terms the green certificate market and the electricity market. So it's, it's ended from, from an other side. Uh, and then we have something which is historically very much focused on, and that's you know creating new renewable energy production, going into unconventional sources, it could be geothermal. In this case, this example, which is a floating wind turbine, uh, wave power, tidal power, solar power. Solar power globally, as you know, that's, that's pretty much commercial in a way. It costs a little bit, but it's commercial. It's, it's a mature business. Uh, not so much in Norway. We don't have that much sun. But, but anyhow, this, I think traditionally this has been very important. I'm not sure how important it's going to be in the future to have this technology kind of perspective on what you are doing or if you will change and have more like a business perspective on when you're gonna create these new technologies and, and get them going. But it's, it's no doubt that this is a very challenging field to be because it's extremely expensive to do that last phase of your innovation. Because you have to build something, it takes a lot of concrete, it takes a lot of steel, it's extremely costly. And what you experience in this kind of industry or technologies is that these huge economies of scale. But how, get, how do you get to those economies of scale? You have to prove that it's working in a small scale first, and then you have to ramp it up in, you know, in a, at a you can't make two large jumps at, at once. So, so that's, that's a challenge, and it's probably something we're gonna deal with in the future as well. But, I think traditionally people, I think this is what this ANOVA is doing, and this is probably the area, um, the area of, of interest where we have had least success. Used a lot of money, a lot of project that never kind of took off, and the money is recycled and, and it's used again in other sectors. So very challenging field, and I know there have been initiative from Statoil, which owns this floater, to actually go here and look for possibilities on the east coast of the US as well. 
They're gonna build their first wind farm. I think they're gonna put up five, five of these floaters outside Scotland in, in a few years. And they're also looking at possibilities to build wind farm in connection with the oil and gas platforms and to so support them with the electricity so they can shut down their gas turbines. But that was basically my, my introduction. And then I'm happy to take any question you might have, or this was very briefly, but it's maybe give a sense of what we are doing and what we are dealing with. And it's a field that's developing very fast, so uh, feel free to ask if you have any questions. Thanks so much, and just a reminder to use the mic uh, if, you, if you have a question that you want to ask. Go on. Um, I'm actually pretty interested in what the, so how the political and the private sectors tie in in this, because you're saying that the politicians kind of take like a hands off, like an arm's yeah. length distance approach. So where does this financing come from per se? And the financing is uh, a levy on the transmission tariff for electricity. So it's basically a tax paid by everyone that uses electricity. That's a part of the financing, and the rest of the financing is from a fund owned by the petroleum and energy, and we get the revenues from that fund, or the yearly yield. And that yield is equivalent to 10-year uh, uh, state bonds. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding how the private sector is uh, receiving this support from you guys, because, example, in the U.S., Apart from invest, doing investments, there's also policies in terms of uh, credits, tax credit, and all these kind of things that makes it really profitable. Mm. But it seems here you just do investment, you don't do any tax credit. So is that enough to bring in people? Yeah, in, in if, if, uh, so this, um, you have to be selective where you go in and try to make a difference. 300 million US dollar, that's a lot of money, but it's also very little money if you look at the sector that you try to change. So, so you have to be very efficient and you also have to find efficient way of kind of like distributing this money. So what we basically do, we give this as a grant, a cash grant paid out based on uh, accurate cost, accurate investment costs. So, so, so it's a very simple way, we sign a contract, they have a financing plan, they have a budget, and as long as they start to invest, they pay a part of their investment. So it's very, in a way, very simple. There's not a lot of regulatory risk and, 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 and other risks. So, so that's just a way of doing it. And over money then, it's kind of like a quasi, what you could call it like equity that goes into, so we basically take down the investment costs, which basically means that you get away with a lower cash flow. So, so it's actually that simple. Well, I, l I looked at the numbers that you provided. Uh, it seems like you affected about 10% of the Norwegian energy demand. Uh, if I do this right, 20 yeah. terawatt hours per year, is that correct? Yeah, uh, but, yeah. But, but there is there is a point here and that we are looking at intensities. So when we finish, no, we when <laughs> finish, I mean, when we finance uh, energy efficiency project, they might use the same amount, for example, in an aluminum plant. What they do, in, they don't use less energy, but they just produce very much more aluminum. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 you know, when you look at those 20 terawatt hours, that's compared to the uh, to a base scenario. Okay, and then the cost was about 10 cent per kilowatt yeah. hour per year saved, right? or newly generated no. or... Yeah. So this is about, if you look at it, that's about the energy cost. So you, your upfront investment is about a year's worth of, uh, of energy cost, if, if I do my math right. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering how that, that is was... distributed. Is, is there any type of projects that are more attractive or um, that, that give you a lot of terawatt hours yeah. historically? Yes, it's been like that because it's it's a little, since this is, uh, it's you're picking low hanging fruits first. 
So, but, but as you say, for the result, just to comment that first, yeah, it basically means that you do have a cost equivalent to the energy costs, but then these investments is gonna last in average 15, 20 years. So, so in that way, the subsidies are fairly low. But to say, but uh, as you pointed out as well, it's, yeah, it has been uh, uh, a lot of trying to pick the low-hanging fruit first. But that also means that we are changing now more and more over to the technology strategy and where we, you know, we are very, we are, uh, we are if you're gonna start that, you know, to, to build those markets, you have to make sure that you have enough money and you can stay in there long enough so you can't enter into too many of those like we did with district eating. You can't have a, you can't spend that kind of money in, in, in all markets and sectors. So I guess we are putting more and more money into the technology strategies and kind of like pushing costs down. It's, it's a very important then. But then there was one on the back row here. Uh, I was curious to, uh, to hear more about the, the thing about the droughts and the dependence of the system on yeah. water because in Brazil we had the same problem and, and the strategy that we have been doing the last decade is dirtying the matrix. So we, we are diversifying and putting mm. lots of thermal, especially oil and, um, and coal to, mm. to, to balance out the matrix. Uh, so I, I, it was not clear to me what strategies are using in Norway no. to, to, yeah. to avoid that, the, the, the risk of lack of water. What the NOVA is doing to help, you know, to solve that short-term uh, security of supply problem is to diverse, help diversifying the energy supply, but also to do, uh, you know, to take uh, introduce measure that lowers the need for heat because that figure, which was I, I just go back to that very quick, um, the top figure. The top figure shows the consumption over the year, and we have a high, fairly high winter consumption compared to the summer consumption. So if you can lower that curve, that also help on the security. And then, then it's kind of like to even out the, the, the demand throughout the year is, is very important. And what you do then is you go in and insulate the buildings, basically. So, so that's important. But then it also to build up this, this second infrastructure like we have did, done with, with district heating then is to you know, it's a diversifying strategy, and and in on the west coast and where there is access to natural gas, there is also being built up some some natural gas networks. We also will help diversify the the system. Just a quick follow up on that. Another problem that we have connected to that in Brazil is that nowadays, due to environmental worries, we cannot build any more hydroelectric plants with reservoirs. Yeah. So they are, and this limits a lot yeah. our capacity of managing the, the droughts. Mm. I don't know and, if in Norway do. Uh, usually have reservoirs in your hydroelectric plants. Yeah, it's, and, and I seriously doubt that we're going to build any any more large reservoirs in Norway. But Norway have quite high storage capacity when it comes to hydro, and we have high altitudes, so we produce a lot of power, you know, a lot of energy in short time. So that gives us a great flexibility, and it also gives a possibility to sell power or affect watts to the rest of Europe, which now have a lot of regulatory, you know, how they're gonna regulate they, their, their production because of the, all that wind and all that sun. So, so, uh, so, so that's, um, that's, that's a part of it uh, in Norway. I, I, yeah, and, but another thing that of course helps on that short-term concern about the security of supply is building more interconnectors with the countries around us. So we can basically, and then we hook up this water and our hydro-based system with a thermal-based and now solar and wind power-based system in Northern Europe. And we can, you know, get a very efficient system going. So there are decisions in Norway to build interconnector boats to the UK and more interconnectors to Germany. Oh. Thank you. So changing residential behavior is difficult and often expensive. Have you, have your residential programs worked upstream much to change the practices and opinions of contractors and trades professionals who then influence the purchasing decisions of customers, of end, end customers? Yeah, we are trying. 
are trying. It's difficult. We have, we have looked, uh, and when you're talking residential, we have focused a lot on the buildings that people live in. Uh, changing the behavior of the carpenter, I think it's as hard as changing the behavior as, of the household search. But we have this program for new buildings that's pretty much set the standard for the rest of the buildings, the existing ones, you know. So we are putting efforts in there and, you know, trying to work with the good examples and having demonstration projects and actually work with those few carpenters and other contractors to see that there is uh, upside in doing innovative projects. So, so, so that, but in the future, I think we have to work more with that. But it's a difficult market to get into because the residential, especially the single house market, is pretty much left to the least professional part of the contractor business. So it, well, we see larger contractors building apartment buildings and, and, and more you know, buildings for professionals. There, there might be some, some incentives to be innovative and kind of like be in the forefront. But single houses, difficult. But I think we have to do more there. Yeah, quick question. So, uh... Just, I, I was just wondering whether you support projects only in Norway, or do you also support Norwegian projects that Norwegian companies have uh, outside of Norway? And if I could also just follow up on that question of the hydro developing new hydropower plants, if in fact Norway has more uh, possibility, unutilized capacity, so to say, in developing new hydropower plants, is that something that is being considered to possibly export further, further export electricity to? the European countries mm. who actually badly need it, as you say, to mm. stabilize the system. Thank you. Yeah, um, to take the last first, balancing power is interesting for Norway, especially if you build that interconnectors. You know, you can get very well paid by, by, by selling that to, to someone who has a balancing problem. Northern Germany, for example, on a cloudy day when the wind doesn't blow. So, so yeah, that's, that's a strategy, but there is, that's, uh, uh, that's also a lot of risk into that, because the last, if you build, <laughs> if you build one interconnector too many, <laughs> that, market, that balance in power market is, is more or less going to collapse, then, of course, you don't, then you don't make any revenue on the cable itself, and it's very costly. So that, that's a little challenging. But yeah, maybe in the future, you truly move into a fully integrated European market with not as much bottlenecks as we have today in the networks. And then they, you, you can you know, see that prices are evening out, and it's basically where the new power will be built, where the resources are the best. I seriously doubt that we will build a whole lot of new hydro in Norway, because that's controversial due to other environmental concerns than the climate. Uh, but um, climate change basically means that we have more hydropower because it rains more. So, well, we kind of like make a profit on, on the climate problem here. But I can see, I can, we can, I can clearly see that we will uh, operate over hydropower differently in a system with more, more interconnectors and pump storage might be actual. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, um, are you the only company providing those in energy efficiency programs in Norway, or are, for example, utility companies providing these kind of programs as well? Uh, Enova is pretty much the answer of a strategy that didn't work throughout the 90s. Norway was fairly early out deregulating the electricity market in 1990, and then it was said by law that the utilities also should work with energy efficiency and kind of, you know, giving information and so on to the customers. And they were actually able or allowed to finance that activity with a tiny little uh, levy on the transmission tariff. It didn't give a, a whole lot of results, a um, lot of reports, little actions, very different how they did it. Uh, around the country. Uh, so actually, ANOVA was an answer to that strategy that they had throughout the 90s that didn't work. So politicians decided, well, let's put this into a national fund, set up a little efficient body, and kind of like, you know, take that market development strategy instead of, of just being out there and kind of like 
mostly doing information measures and yeah. So, so, so that was something that was tried and didn't work out in Norway at least. We had a we were we had an early project out on one of these remote islands in Norway with, with wind power in combination with the hydrogen production and fuel cell. Uh, that's coming back. I think it's becoming more and more important, especially now when we are moving into transport sector as well and this electrification of the transport sector. That's 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 very interesting because then you see the need that you need a lot of power. You know, if you're gonna charge a battery ferry, for instance, we have the first battery ferry now. So that has a battery package on the boat, of course, to run the engine, but it also has the same size battery package on each side of the, of the fjord, because you have to dump all that power at once. So because, of course, people, people like a green ferry to say it that way, but they don't like to wait on, on shore. They want to get on board and get across. So yeah, storage is becoming more and more, more important. And, and, but then that's also when we diversify now our supply system and you have a heat demand, storing hot water is very cheap. So there might be options in a cold climate country like Norway to actually make this heat distribution system work smoothly together with the electricity system. Because this, no doubt that electricity is very attractive in a low carbon economy because you can have, you, you don't want to have, you will not have any emissions on the end use side. But, but then you have the storage issues and all that, but I think there is possibilities to make that work fairly smoothly if that heat infrastructure is big enough to make a difference. So, so, so that's very interesting. But we are working with other things as well, batteries and more in the technology path. Change this. Uh, so one of those things that can change the economics of all this is carbon price, either tax or something. Do you have any stance on that? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, Norway was very, I think Norway was the first country in the world uh, putting a tax on carbon emissions. Uh, it's important in order to create a market in the bottom. And I think from an environmental policy side, it's, it's wise, you know, the polluted prey principle. But as it looks today, you need to also be competitive while we sit there and hope and wait for a global carbon price. And what we see is now new ideas is developing more out of a purely Prof, uh, see profit-seeking business point of view, where you actually see that, yeah, if you can have the source for free, you might be actually able to compete sometime in the future with the fossil fuels that cost a lot to bring to the market. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important there at the bottom, but uh, I don't think we should build our business on being reluctant of that in the future, no when that's gonna happen and to what extent is hard to say. Yeah, thank you. Ivan, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Um, thank you also to our, our audience here in person and to the audience uh, on the webinar for joining us today. Uh, just as a reminder, these slides and a video of today's presentation will be made available on the Yale Center for Business and Environment website where we encourage you to visit and uh, look at other webinars in this series, both past and upcoming. So thanks again for your participation, and Ivan, thank you so much for joining us today. And please join us for the next Blueprint for Clean Energy. Thank you.